Metal Gear Survive is controversial. That's the understatement of the century. Konami's incredibly popular Metal Gear franchise has been around since the 80s and has been responsible for some of the most memorable and highly praised video games of all time. Also, a pachinko machine or two. From 1987 to 2015, Konami and famed creator and director Hideo Kojima would make over 20 of these things before an abrupt breakup, a lot of bad blood, a canceled game, and a ton of public outcry. Seriously, if you weren't there, it was wild. But it was in 2018 when the wild card happened. Metal Gear Survive, a brand new game in the Metal Gear series, one produced without Hideo Kojima, seemingly hopping on the zombie trend. One that was nearly universally hated on, with critics throwing it in the sixth zone, user reviews absolutely demolishing the thing, and it ended up on countless worst of 2018 lists across the internet. So, it's been four years now. The dust <laughs> has settled a little bit, and after going hard on Babylon's Fall, Balan Wonderworld, the entire Avatar franchise, and Kakarot, I decided that this was the next logical step. There's a story here, a really interesting one involving a fallout between high-profile developers and a video game that's so absurd it's hard to define. Konami defined Survive as a quote, bold new experience, and well, I won't disagree with them there. And yes, that says recent reviews, mostly positive. So y'all know me, or you don't? Well, I went in, I beat the game 100% asterisk, not actually 100% because oh my god, no, dove really hard into the multiplayer and well, survived as long as I could. There's something really interesting here, and the fact that the current players on Steam today is still nearly 10 times Babylon's fall has to mean something. So yo, it's Austin, and today we're finally deep diving into Metal Gear Survive. Now, I know it took a while, but there's a lot of history here. This was the first game divorced from Kojima. Heck, one of the first major releases from Konami in a time period when they said they were leaving the video game industry to focus on pachinko. It wasn't just a meme. It happened. But before we get started today, if I were stuck in the middle of a zombie apocalypse, I'd definitely be craving a bowl of today's sponsor, Magic Spoon. You know what I like? Cereal. But as an adult and not a growing child, eating cereal is tough. Look, I remember the 90s. My tolerance to sugar, my happiness, it's gone. So here's where Magic Spoon comes into play. You pour yourself a little bowl, splash in a little milk or whatever you like, and bam, you're a child again screaming about anime. Magic Spoon is a delicious and healthy alternative to your old sugar-filled cereals that's not just tasty, but a nice and easy part of any meal. Magic Spoon cereals have zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four to five net grams of carbs in each serving. And that's also only 140 calories. So yeah, keto-friendly, soy-free, grain-free, low-carb, and that's the magic part of the spoon. They sent me a variety pack with all the flavors, which is cocoa, peanut butter, frosted, and fruity. And of the four, I like cocoa the best because, well, it's chocolate. <laughs> Look, it's just nice to have a healthy option for breakfast when everything's usually so heavy. So if you want to get in on this, and you should because Cereal owns, click the link down in the description and try a variety pack with $5 off from me today. Be sure to use the promo code Austin Eruption at checkout. That'll get you $5 off any order as well as help the channel out. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that they have a 100% money back guarantee. So if you don't like it, they'll refund you your money, no questions asked. That's magicspoon.com forward slash Austin Eruption or clicking the link down in the description to save $5 off your purchase purchase today. Thanks to Magic Spoon for the sponsor, I'm eating good, and now you will too. So, Metal Gear Survive. There's a lot here, so let's start at the beginning. There's no Metal Gear without Hideo Kojima. Well, that's at least what the gamers say. But I guess that's what happens when your name's attached to a series for nearly 30 years. From the original MSX release of Metal Gear to the controversial Phantom Pain, Kojima has basically been the spokesperson of this entire thing, even if he didn't want to be, saying in 2011 that he wanted the franchise to end, quote, at every step along the way. I mean, when the lead director of your franchise is out there saying he's probably gonna have to make Metal Gear Solid 5 at some point, that dude's ready to move on. His studio, Kojima Productions, was a subsidiary under Konami, and they worked on just about every Metal Gear title, as well as a few things here and there, until their closure in 2015. There was a lot of controversy, including stuff I'm not really gonna get into here, but TLDR, Konami was planning to get out of the AAA game business, didn't like Kojima going over budget, and things disintegrated into something petty. Konami started removing Hideo's name from everything, they removed PT, aka Silent Hills, from the PlayStation 4, cancelled it, then barred him from going to the 2015 Video Game Awards, causing key for Sutherland to have to accept any awards on his behalf. This was, of course, met with booze. To uh, accept um, any awards. 
A majority of this seems to be tied directly to Konami changing its corporate mission statement, which to this day hasn't changed much. Similar things happened with Koji Igarashi in the Castlevania franchise. Konami is like an IP gold mine that they refuse to dig into. With the exception of a few smaller PC games, mobile titles, footballs, Yu-Gi-Ohs, and ROM collections of older things, they're not really doing much these days. Except like Contra Rogue Core, which yeah. After the fallout with Konami, Kojima Productions teamed up with Sony to make themselves into a fully-fledged independent studio, which, as most of us know, led to the creation of Death Stranding. I'm just glad that Kojima got his game with Norman Reedus, the eternally greasy man, even if we had to watch those weird baby trailers. So let's move on to 2016. Metal Gear Solid V's been out for about a year, it had super good reviews despite a mixed reception from a small vocal minority. Due to the internet being the internet, people found traces of cut content and consumed conspiracy theoried drama between Koji Pro and Konami, but that's not for this video. This is about the pretty out there announcement that happened at Gamescom 2016. It was mostly normal, you had a new Yu-Gi-Oh, a new Pro Evolution Soccer, but shocking everyone would be a Metal Gear Survive. There were hints that they were hiring to make a new Metal Gear, but this one looked like it had zombies. <laughs> I think we as a society are all still reeling from the effects of the late 2000s zombie mania. From Left 4 Dead, The Walking Dead, Zombieland, and World War Z, the <laughs> living dead were such a staple of mainstream media culture that fatigue had begun to set in. So when you, and I still can't believe they did this, push out the dude who made your series famous and announce a new game with zombies at the forefront, you're gonna get in trouble. It definitely comes off as creatively bankrupt, even without any knowledge of what the game is. From the first trailer, you see Snake leaving behind a soldier who gets isekai through a portal into a world with these corrupted looking zombies that we'd learn are called Wanderers. The whole shtick was trying to find your way back home, presumably meaning un yourself and getting back into Metal Gear Solid 5. A small detail I actually liked on the logo was the fact that the second V in Survive was corrupted and similar to Metal Gear Solid 5, which makes more sense when you realize that the game did a lot of smart asset flipping. We'll get more into that later. Famously, Kojima responded to Survive's announcement in a not so favorable way. Quote, the Metal Gear games are about political fiction and espionage. Where do zombies fit in with that? Which I find hilarious considering Metal Gear has had a shaman, telekinesis, ghosts, and not to mention an immortal vampire. Or a, a bisexual with nanomachines. No. Vamp isn't for vampire, it's because he's bisexual. I'll tell you right now that no, these aren't zombies in the traditional sense, and they are actually something that does fit into the lore of Metal Gear, but we'll touch that later. After this Gamescom trailer, the anti-hype machine began doing its thing, and the internet pretty much condemned everything about this. <laughs> Which, you know, fair. But I'm a freak, and I like to know as much as I can about something before I toss it into the garbage, so I signed up for the open beta test in 2018. And I kinda liked it. The open beta of Survive was a multiplayer only only thing that showcased the co-op game modes. It was hard to tell what this game was going to be from the early trailers, but that answer ended up being a post-apocalyptic zombie tower defense game. And I don't know about you, but tower defense is like the third best video game genre behind Vampire Survivor and Kart Racers, so I hopped in with a few friends and I was having a pretty good time. You'd need to defend a giant crystal while setting up traps and taking care of waves of enemies. It turns out if you put a co-op wave defense game in the Fox engine, easily the best part of Metal Gear 5, if you have a recipe for a good time. Did it feel like Metal Gear? Absolutely not. Over the next two years, Konami would release trailers showcasing bits and pieces of gameplay before the official release, February 20th, 2018. They actually put it out there at a budget price of $30, I guess kind of knowing its fate. Well, that didn't help. It got pretty middle-of-the-road critical reviews, but was destroyed by fans and YouTubers alike. This thing peaked right away, sold very poorly, dipped in price heavily after the first few weeks, and that was that. I actually bought a PS4 copy of this two months later for like 15 bucks, but it remained sealed until last month. This is Metal Gear Survive, the controversial most recent and possibly even final game in the series, but I didn't play this version, so it'd be gone. The multiplayer and single player campaign are both kind of like intertwined here, but we might as well start with the first thing that we end up seeing, which is the story. Wish me luck. Survive is directly tied into Metal Gear Solid 5 and Ground Zeroes. Shortly after being played like a damn fiddle, you play as a create a character in that situation who died. <laughs> nice. Then they somehow take your body and toss it through a wormhole into a world called Dite, or as you're nicely told, you made it through the gates of hell. 
this is a lot for the first 15 minutes of the game, and they don't do a good job at getting you excited or knowing what's going on. After a slight rehash of the Ground Zero's cutscene with some other elements tossed in, and seeing your character's name appear on a killed in action sheet mere moments into making them, you get sucked from real cutscenes into a static image and endless dialogue. Essentially, during the wormhole opening, your arm gets infected by some type of organism from Detay, and they send you there in order to investigate. You and researcher Good Luck keeps in contacts with you, dubs you Captain, and guides you towards Base Camp, a little place outside an alternate version of Mother Base that's destroyed. Kind of ironic that his name's Good Luck, considering the ridiculousness of the situation. Here you explore the dangerous zone called The Dust, and meet various characters like Reeve, Nicholas, Dan, Miranda, and various Metal Gear stereotypes that don't get any kind of meaningful development, screen time, or like anything, really. You know, for a game called Metal Gear, it's sure lacking in a lot of the fun that those games have. Granted, the situation here is pretty dire, but in my entire time playing, there was nothing like Revolver Ocelot twirling his guns for way too long. Survive lacks a lot of charm of the predecessors. There's not even a good moment to do a funny model swap with. In detail, you find the supposed zombies or wanderers. You're also somehow able to keep contact with the outside world in another dimension, which I'll uh, shrug off because this is a video game. Good luck introduces you to a robot AI called Virgil, who's got a split personality that guides you along the way. No, not that Virgil. That's the setup, find your way home, it's simple and effective. Now, the Metal Gear franchise is famed for having cutting edge stealth gameplay, all the way from the original in 87 to even spinoffs like Metal Gear Acid. So, does Survive do it? Well, kind of? Oh, right off the bat, the PC version still says Metal Gear Survive Beta, even in 2022, so take that as you will. Metal Gear Survive's gameplay loop is bizarre. Take everything you know about Metal Gear Solid 5 and the Fox engine, then toss it into a survival game, like Rust or Ark. You need to eat, you need to drink, and manage your oxygen. In Survive, you're going to be spending a whole lot of time micromanaging your health resources while also trying to be stealthy, and this comes off like a weird indie game in comparison to 5. MGS5 gives you the ability to ramble your way through situations, but Survive has you, at first, cheesing it out. At the very start, all you have is a dinky little wooden spear and quickly draining hunger and thirst. Surviving is key, so you'll frequently be hunting for water and food sources. A lot of the stuff you'll find is dirty and that can poison you, so you gotta cook or boil it. You can hunt animals with a bow or a machete, but there's nothing quite as effective as punching them in the mouth. Yeah, this is real. You have to poke zombies to death in order to kill them, and you get a resource called Cubon Energy, which is used for most things. Wanderers can drop items, but you'll also be scavenging the environment for things to craft and do other things. You can only make, like, a bandage at the beginning, but you'll find blueprints that'll give you access to bigger and better things, be it weapons, armor, types of food, buildings, or even C4. After the initial tutorials and cutscenes, which are, to be completely honest, one of the most dreadfully boring experiences in all video games, you're set loose to explore and you do this like any old open world game. You just pick a direction and go. The world itself is a rescan of the Afghanistan map from 5, and you'll have vague marked locations trying to tell you where to go. However, this isn't a zone called the Dust, which doesn't have a tracking GPS and requires you to have an oxygen machine. One that, uh, failed to load. Girl. What you doing? In the dust, you'll find lots of wanderers who can easily kill you as well as give you injuries that you'll have to bandage up or get debuffs from, like the inability to naturally heal. The first time you go into the dust, your oxygen depletes quickly and you can consume Cubon energy to regen, but it's very expensive. Basically, the entire world wants you to die and unfortunately, there's no quick save. So if you die, you have to reload your last save and that might be a while back. It creates this sense of peril while exploring, which was actually relatively fun. Like, you'd be trying to sneak around Wanderers and their upgraded versions, trying to find supplies and just make it another day. The very beginning of this game kicks you in the butt if you're not familiar with survival type games, and I can see how that would be off-putting for, uh, most people. But for those who are a glutton for punishment, dig in. Not to mention, any weapon or armor that you craft has durability tied to it. So let's say you make yourself a slightly more advanced weapon with just barely enough resources. If you use it too much or you run out of ammo, 
ammo, you probably won't have enough to repair it. That means if you're anything like me, you'll be stuck with the bow and arrow for a while. And not the good arrows, the bad arrows. But that's how you get good at those headshots. Eventually though, if you're feeling the gameplay, you'll get into the swing of it. The story, while kind of boring for a majority of the time, keeps evolving as you explore this horrible gray world and you begin to slowly beef yourself up and get an understanding of the loop. Suddenly you're gunning down waves of dudes without a care in the world and you're carrying around so much beef jerky that there's no issue. Besides being over encumbered, that is. It always sucks and it's probably gonna happen a lot. You've leveled up to have bigger combos. Maybe you've gone and crafted yourself a fire baseball bat. Maybe it's Stockholm Syndrome, but uh, I was kind of having fun. Is that illegal? Then boom, the servers went down, forced to disconnect because yes, survive is online only. Playing the single player for so long actually made me kind of forget that the game was co-op, but not in the way that you thought it was gonna be, cause like, if you look at those early trailers, you see four people running around in the world stabbing zombies and everything, but the actual game itself is quite different. Earlier I said the multiplayer is separate but intertwined with the single player campaign, and here's what I meant. You actually unlock it pretty early, but I don't recommend going in for a while because, well, you're gonna be useless. Metal Gear Survive shares character progress between the two modes, which means level, gear, and your blueprints. If you hop in right away, you'll be running around with a spear and a bow, which isn't gonna be helpful for your party. There's two types of modes here, rescue missions, and the aforementioned tower defense mode, salvage. In salvage, you have a singularity digger in the center of the map with enemies coming to you and waves dictated by road lines. You'll want to use your previously gotten resources to craft traps and structures to block the way and try to defend the point with your friends. You can grab stuff and do mini quests inside the mission to get more consumable crafts, but the goal is always the same. Defend and survive. The further you get into the single player, the more options you have, meaning the more things that you can do. And it gets pretty ridiculous. Suddenly you have like fire traps, cause why not? The weird part is that for completing these levels, you get a metric butt ton of resources for crafting as well as some exclusive blueprints. While playing single player for like 25 hours, I was still struggling to have enough gun power to make consistent ammo, but after three multiplayer missions, I had a ton. It's pretty evident that they want you to go between the two modes, but it's really weird that they didn't make the entire thing like one experience. I think survive could have been way better if they let you and a friend explore the dust together, but lobbies it is. This mode really shows the strength of the Fox engine though, as you'll be mowing through through quite literally hundreds of dudes with your friends. Then there's more than a few zombie types too. It starts with your basic boys before you're introduced to explodey boys, armored guys, and the whole works. Initially, CQC seems kind of useless, which sounds like heresy for Metal Gear, as all it does is knock guys down, but once you find out it can instantly kill people from behind, even stronger mobs, it goes way faster. Even if the CQC animations are ridiculous, like they took the ones from 5 and just sped it up, uh, this seems wrong. It takes a while to get there, but once you've got a lobby filled with a few friends and you're playing some of the more intensive missions, it's not bad. Metal Gear? Absolutely not. It's literally a tower defense game, but it's a decent one. Less fun is the rescue mode, which has you escorting dudes from point A to B while avoiding a giant squid. That's more weird than zombies, I think. This one didn't feel as good, but it doesn't seem like the game thinks that either, because it's hardly ever featured. Besides crafting resources, you also get damaged version of craftable items, both weapons and armor. These each have customizable variants, so you can go all heavy or all quiet if you'd like, but 9 out of 10 times your OC is gonna look really stupid anyways. Or hey, maybe you just put on a crocodile hat and call it a day. No judging here. It's so wiggly. Why? But in order to craft a lot of these items, you're gonna need access to proper facilities in the single player mode, so back you go. Which brings me to my next point, base building. I love base building. Be it Dark Cloud, Satisfactory, Valheim, or Minecraft, if you put base building in your video game, I'm probably gonna like it. Metal Gear Solid 5 had it to a certain extent, but Survive took it a whole step further. Oh god, where to begin? In survive, bases function for multiple reasons. Wave survival, resource sustainability, and crafting. As you go through the story, you'll find a few named NPCs before getting quests to unlock randomly generated NPCs to help you function. You assign these dudes to different departments, be it medical, food, development, or even exploration, so you can play a mini Facebook-style waiting game and reap the rewards 24 hours later. The more people you have, the more efficiently things run, the bigger the numbers get. 
good. For example, you'll run around the open world, find seeds, bring them back, and craft yourself some farms, assign yourself some survivors to it, and they'll take care of that, and then you can grab yourself some carrots every now and then so you won't die. But your base also needs resources, so you can make water tanks and beef up your kitchen so everyone's taken care of. These NPCs can die and have a happiness meter which will influence how well they work. I didn't really have much of an issue with this, and none of my guys died, but once again, survive is the king of micromanaging in a game. Once that's taken care of, you can find blueprints via the story or randomly in the world to literally create your base piece by piece. And this is the stuff in games I can get sucked into forever. Every now and then you have to activate the digger, similar to the ones in multiplayer, and the zombies that attack can permanently destroy your buildings, so you'll want to make things guarded as well as possible. For me, that meant making several walls and traps on the ground. This game has a count of days you've survived in the menu, so you'll know just how long you've been playing. This does come into a play at a certain point for story reasons, but it doesn't really do much else. Granted, a lot of this isn't very complex, and it's kind of surface level, but I was surprised to see a AAA style game go the route of Ark or Rust, especially something Japanese like Metal Gear. You're placing down living quarters, and then some of the need to micromanage your crew and hunger and thirst goes away. But unfortunately, you're gonna have to keep track of the oxygen the entire experience, except in multiplayer. All of this culminates in the player feeling way more sustainable and much less afraid of running out into the dust. The first time I went out there, I died twice, and I was like, oh god, what have I signed up for? I definitely wouldn't call Survive a good video game, but it was checkmarking some of those early access survival game cravings I have. Put that in a game that does feel a little bit like Metal Gear and the controls, and you got yourself something. It's for somebody. But with every Metal Gear comes some sort of crazy revelation or over the top climax. Well, I'm pleased to say that Metal Gear Survive tried. Congratulations. A narrative can take all kinds of crazy twists and turns, but if you don't have a memorable cast of characters, then that all goes down the drain. Since you assume the role of a silent protagonist, you end up experiencing the world through a character named Reeve, and sometimes Virgil. Reeve is, like you, another guy who ended up here for some reason, except he's moody and doesn't want to help anyone till the very end of the game. Classic, uh, hero character. There's only a handful of named characters you rescue along the way, each of which has the exact same extraction cuts scene, I might add, but all of their talking and exchanges happen in the slideshow bits that have an uninteresting interface, like it's just showing you screenshots while going between characters. Now that I've seen this, I know I'm right. Sometimes it'll even have scenes that might have been choreographed, but were cut down to this at the very last second, almost as if budget cuts. The story actually does go to some interesting places as well. You keep hearing about something called the Lord of Dust, which is essentially a giant amalgamation that roams the land and destroys everything in its path. This is the thing controlling the wanderers. This is the big bad that you have to defeat. It's exactly what good luck, Mr. Discount Lawrence Fishburne here, wants you to do. He has you exploring the wasteland in order to find more more resources and memory pods containing info on how to defeat this beast until you gather enough energy to make a big ol' wormhole getting back home. This unfortunately fails and takes your party to a completely different zone of detail, one without base building that's an asset flip of Africa from MGS5. Here you'll find Dan and Seth, two survival members of another team out in the dust. There's a lot of weird middling here, but basically, it's nanomachines. It's always nanomachines. The zombies, a creation of nanomachines trying not to die. The Lord of Dust, a huge supergroup of nanomachines. Seth, a good guy? No, a big bad representation of nanomachines. Nanomachines suck. Take that, zombie haters. It's the bare minimum. Oh, also, there's time travel. Don't ask. The whole plot, and it's one I had to think about a little bit because it's wacky, is one that stacks together time travel and dimension traveling. In this weird dimension of detail, the Lord of Dust is a giant nanomachine creature that loops back in time in order to destroy things over and over. And all of this is because of the wormhole generator that was introduced in Metal Gear Solid 5. The entire plot of this game is basically caused by the experimentation and ethical ramifications of a wormhole device, a silly game mechanic in 5. I I think that's kinda neat, actually. It's a way to explore the lore without getting too heavy-handed, deviating from the point, and also keeping things political adjacent. This is why in Detay and The Dust, you'll occasionally have things drop out of the sky and hit the ground. 
Like, this entire world is a messed up storage area for the wormhole tests that went wrong. It's totally bonkers and probably would have been a bit cooler if you had the more action-oriented gameplay. In a twist that you'll barely notice because of the awful screenshot storytelling, you end up rescuing a wheelchair-bound child named Chris, sending him through the wormhole to try and rescue everyone else, and surprise, that's actually good luck. You sent him all the way to 1943, so he grows up trying to rescue you. This could have been a cool cutscene, but it wasn't. Oh yeah, the day survived mechanics. At a certain point, it's revealed that the player character is also infected with nanomachines, and they only have a limited amount of days left to live before they take over and presumably kill you. AKA, go beat the big bad before the time expires. The only way to kill the Lord of Dust and beat this game is to harness the power of a broken down Metal Gear Sahelanthropus. You use a couple of digging devices to trap it in place through multiple ways of combat, then you teach the machine the concept of death through various Wikipedia pages and blast it right through the face. GG, you saved Dite and got a happy ending. And by that I mean everyone is still trapped there with no idea how to get out and the credits roll. Yay. Or you go for the alternate ending. There's one where you send Chris into the past to try and save your crew, and instead of joining them, you turn around and jump into the portal yourself. Then you're just stuck wandering a desert. It's hinted that your character becomes one of the wandering soldiers you see in the Metal Gear Solid 5 side ops, which is a, I guess, a neat little thing. But as far as the story goes, that's it. I think this could have been a lot better if Konami had put a little more into the cutscenes and like character development. But I think a lot of the issues here come from the blowback from the audience, you know, the people getting mad that the game existed in the first place. On top of that, you have Konami's whole cost cutting measures and it's like, okay, I can see why. But that's not all for Metal Gear Survive. It actually has an end game. And I did my best to get as far into it as A, I could stomach and B, the player count would allow me to. Though I gotta say, Metal Gear Survive having 10 times the daily player count that Pavilion's Fall has over 4 years after its release is comical. After the final cutscene in Survive, it basically throws the gauntlet down and says, I, we gotta keep building up our bases, digging for more energy, and make ourselves a little community here. The characters basically decided to live instead of leave by saving the world and getting rid of the Lord of Dust, which is weird that Wanderers still exist, but whatever. Pesky little bisexual nano machines. Unfortunately, Survive looks the same the entire time. Similar to Metal Gear Solid 5, the map lacks a lot of variety in its locations. It's just a lot of desert, or the smaller Africa version of Dite, most of the time shrouded in gray. So for the crazy amount of hours that it wants you to play for completion, it's like two colors. Pretty when it's not though, but that's rare. Endgame unlocks a few things. First off, daily based defenses. These were story only until now, though it's kind of bizarre that they're on a 24 hour timer. You can only do it once a day. You also get a final memory board that'll unlock subclasses. I know we just mentioned Babylon's Fall, but just like that game, Survive doesn't allow you to get the best gameplay mechanics in until after you beat the story. That can take a while, by the way, depending on your skill level. The four subclasses are Assault, Jaeger, Medic, and Scout, each of which gives you straight up new abilities to use that should have been unlockable from the start. Like, Jaeger lets you have a Reign of Arrows ability, giving combat a slightly more arcadey feel. I was playing Scout when I got this, though, as it gave me an active camouflage and the ability to repair buildings so I could keep fences up. But overall, really, it's just a bit more of the same. You're getting more resources to build more things, to do more quests, to eventually fight one of the two single-player super bosses, Big Mouth and Frostbite, both of which are going to require a lot of grinding and leveling up to take down. Though in order to make any meaningful and speedy leveling progress, you're going to need to do it in multiplayer. So force a few friends to play or poke around some discords, because you're going to need it. We've already talked about the two different types of missions, and well, that's what you get. Both rescue and salvage here have easy, normal, hard, and extreme versions that increase the challenges, the types of mobs that spawn, and rewards. It starts pretty normal, but at a certain point you'll have to start dealing with elemental weaknesses and vulnerabilities, so you'll have to bring in specific toolkits. Also, you unlock extreme difficulty at level 69. Nice. It's like I'm playing TF2 right now for real. There's some fun little mechanics here, such as being able to use the walker in the middle of waves so you can mow down wanderers real fast. Some of the weapons that you find are real strong, and the skins you unlock are what you'd expect. They just unfortunately got a little greedy. Y'all know about microtransactions. Time to buy some survive coins. I expected this, but I wasn't prepared for them to sell a save slot. Spend about $10 in coins and then sure, kid. The fan reception to this was probably what you would expect. <laughs> Not a great look for sure. Now there are events they rotate that have cosmic 
cosmetics and craftable items that you can spend an event currency on. You can get an outfit of Eva, the boss, or Raiden, but if you want Eva or the boss with a little booby action, that's microtransactions only. You can't make this up. Besides event and weekly missions, that's really about it. Konami had a few events trickle out over the first few months, including one with a pyramid head skin and some other Konami-related music tracks and items, but they've essentially been in maintenance mode since late 2018. The latest news we've gotten was a year-end customer inquiry in December of 2021, three years after it launched. So like, a big gap of nothing. The salvage game mode itself has a lot of positives going for it, but Konami sure dropped support for this thing faster than Seamus dropped Daniel Bryan. But hey, make sure to sign up for the premium boost pass so you can get points faster. I considered doing it, but at a certain point I had to stop. As far as 100% completion goes, Metal Gear Survive is incredibly tedious. I had originally considered playing this on the PS4 so I could go for the Platinum Trophy like I've done with all the other games we've done here, but this game was listed at a bare minimum 200 hours. To do this, you have to fully explore every map, which is rougher than you think. Anytime you're in the dust, you don't appear on the mini-map unless you've got a tower placed down or you're standing next to a road, so there's a lot of running around aimlessly. Then you've also got to kill 300 enemies with every single weapon type in the game, grind up and beat the two super bosses, recruit 30 individual crew members, and oh yeah, eat and cook every type of food and collect every weapon and piece of gear in the game. Needless to say, I decided not to do that. But considering it's a sheer grind that doesn't unlock anything meaningful or new, I think that's okay. So if you're sitting there saying I didn't beat Metal Gear Survive because I didn't cook every animal in the game, well, checkmate on me. Time to punch more zebras. <laughs> You know, sometimes the internet is filled with profound and nuanced takes on things, especially with video games. But in the case of Metal Gear Survive, I think things have been a little, maybe a little extreme. Steam says I've got about 50 hours into this, which isn't a whole lot, but it was a lot of me just exploring and doing like quests that weren't randomly generated until I couldn't do it anymore. But also, I think there's a couple things to like here. It's definitely soulless and does reek of money grubbing here and there, but they decided to do that with probably the least safe game possible. In a game that's mostly negative or mid, I found this way more enjoyable than Babylon's Fall and even Balan Wonderworld. Kakarot's still the best, obviously, but only this game has playable music from Boktai and Castlevania. You can collect cassette tapes throughout the world and broadcast them around your base area, which makes hanging relaxing. A cheap pop, I know, but if you put Vampire Killer in my ears, and I'm good to go. I actually enjoy the slow crawl through the wasteland. Once the Lord of Dust starts appearing in your world, you'll occasionally run into this thing on the map and it's terrifying every time. What a lot of people probably see as tedious with the survival mechanics I saw was deliberate and, well, the challenge. There's a popular PC mod that actually turns off the hunger and thirst mechanics, but not for me. It could be the JRPG menu navigating nerd in me, but I didn't mind having the micromanage status effects the entire time. I actually enjoyed the challenge of, well, trying to stay alive. I could also see why people wouldn't. This is small, but I love how the mission complete loot works. You sit there after finishing a dig and then down from the heavens, or uh, the wormholes, comes a couple of color-coded cardboard boxes that give you supplies. It's silly, but it makes me laugh. Also, did you know there were cars in this game? Walkers, sure, but like, I drove a vehicle at one point, and it gave me a tutorial, and then I never found one again. I talked to multiple people who never found one, so hey, lucky me. This game definitely has very specific expectations of the player, though. If you're too good at wave survival and setting up dubs, there will be moments where nothing's happening for like 20 to 40 seconds. That does does give you enough time to try to like recoup some resources like arrows from corpses, so there is that. Most of Survive's challenges build around the loop of gathering supplies to set up a heist essentially, which then becomes integrated into the stealth gameplay. But it can chaotically shift between stealth and Rambo at a moment's notice, and the AI is ruthless. And that's why they made the revival pills. Is this a good Metal Gear game? No, absolutely not. But I don't think it's a bad video game, and that's really my main point. If you try to divorce the concept away from Metal Gear and simply look at it as a survival game from Konami in the same engine, things look a lot better. It's just really hard not to view how that company treated Koji Pro in the last few years of its existence, what with the crappy work conditions and the outspoken press against it. It's definitely got a lot of flaws inherent in the design, and the cons do outweigh the negatives, but like, well, it's not a very glitchy game. It held steady about 95% of the time I was playing until the Steam servers went down, logging me out and making me replay like 40 minutes. Thanks, Steam Summer Sale, you ruined my afternoon.
Despite all the negative press, the huge outpouring against it, and even a lack of things to do in the end game, it is amazing to me that this game still manages to have more than 100 people playing on Steam alone on a daily basis. Truly, this game must have captivated some people, and I can see why. It's really freaking weird, and combining the Metal Gear style of movement, CQC, and hijinks into a survival style game really is a no-brainer. It just happened under not great conditions. So what's the aftermath? Metal Gear Survive got its 15 minutes of fame at a budget price, and by fame I mean hate, before quickly disappearing from the ears of all gamers, and uh, that was pretty much it. It became a laughing stock, frequented worsts of 2018 lists all over the place, and well, I kind of disagree when you got games like The Quiet Man out there, I can totally understand why people would feel that way. Is anything happening in the world of Metal Gear? No, not really. The official Twitter account retweets art and posts about anniversaries here and there. We're currently in the 35th anniversary of the franchise, and the most we're getting seems to be re-upping ports of Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3 due to licensing rights, and that's really a shame. Fans of Metal Gear should be eating, or getting some modern ports to play on, well, any modern platform, but here we are. It's 2022 and Konami refuses to do anything with most of their incredible IPs. What a shocker. We'll get a new Suikoden, Rocket at night, Contra, Metal Gear, Goemon, Silent Hill, Castlevania, or Gradius one day, am I right guys? Guys? If I were to give Metal Gear Survive an arbitrary score, it'd have to be two separate ones. As a Metal Gear game with all of the expectations that has, it's a 5. It's totally mid in just about every way, it's probably the worst Metal Gear game, it has a few elements of the series but it really lacks a lot of that character. The microtransactions are overly greedy but aren't intrusive in the single player game experience, which is unique. You're probably not going to have a second character unless you're a fanatic for the multiplayer like those 60 people online right now. As a video game experience on its own, mostly prop up as a Fox Engine shenanigan simulator. I think it's like a 6.5 or something. It has moments that are genuinely fun. Setting up a death trap dungeon to make a meat grinder out of zombies is a good time. Barely surviving a trip to the dust is exhilarating and the few stealth heavy moments are genuinely exciting, even at the CQC is initial D speeds. But if you were to ask me this simple question, should I play Metal Gear Survive? My answer is only if you're a freak like me. Just don't go for the platinum, you'll hate yourself. And there you have it, Metal Gear Survive 2 in the bag. It's kind of funny to think that I started playing this game in June, finished it in June, and now we're almost in August, but you know, sometimes it takes a while to get the brain moving and everything. But I can say, Babylon's Fall made me stop playing video games for a week and survive didn't, which is about as much praise as I can give it. Speaking of, anyone playing Season 2? You doing okay? I would love for Konami to try and make more Metal Gear games. I think with, you know, a couple of management changes, some fresh talent in there, and maybe a couple apologies, they could really do some good things. They recently put out this uh, weird indie PC game called Crime Sight, which is like an anime social deduction game that I haven't tried, but it seems like people enjoy. But what I'm saying is, Konami, you got IPs, please use them. I will say though, considering Metal Gear Survive is online only, that at some point, probably sooner rather than later, it's gonna get shut down, just like Metal Gear Online before it. So if you are one of those freaks, you should probably hop on it while you still can. Anyways, that's all I got for today. As always, I've been Austin, and that was Metal Gear Survive beaten, so you don't have to. I've got another video coming out next week, and I like to do a little tease here and there, but I figured why not tease something a little bit further out. It's not next or next next or maybe not even next month, but join me soon when I play and beat every Marvel MCU Sega video game. Every. Single. One. Okay, bye. Thank you all so much for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Blackfoot Ferret, Chris Shelton, Christopher Oliva, Darren Newton, Doug Prince, DX Buster, David Molnar, Elijah, GM Pinks, Hey Quiggles, Jay Roos, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Kevin Zanowski, Kieran Arter, Nick Irving, P Funk, Ryan Talbert, and Shazan. Thank you all so much for your generous support. And there you go, Metal Gear Survive in the bag, in your inboxes. I can now uninstall the game and free up some hard drive space. This one did take a little bit longer than I thought it was going to take, as you can tell by the size of the video and just how much I had to go into it, but I'm really happy with the final, uh, the final thing. I think, uh, it's a really interesting piece of history. It's going to be history soon. I, I feel it. I'm a sleepy man, so I'm going to go take a nap. Maybe you should too. Thank you so much for watching. I love you. Good night.